It's only a lucky break that allows us to read my old man at all. Fortunately, the manuscript was resting in a publisher's office when a suitcase containing all but two stories Hemingway had written at the time was stolen from a Paris railroad station. My Old Man was written during those golden years when Hemingway, in his early 20s, was living in Paris, had given up journalism, and was trying to make it as a serious writer. He was poor, and much of the little money he had disappeared at the betting booth at the racetrack. For among his many passions, which included bullfighting, war, and hunting animals, was a passion for horses and betting. Recalling those early years, he remarked that one of the things he liked best in life was to wake up early in the morning with the birds singing in the windows open and the sound of horses jumping. Much of the practical knowledge he soaked up during the long afternoons at the track found its way into my old man. Ever since Huckleberry Finn, American fiction has concerned itself with the joys and troubles of growing up. It's the theme of most of Hemingway's early work, particularly that group of stories about the boyhood and young manhood of Nick Adams, who is a thinly disguised portrait of Hemingway himself. But Nick Adams, like Hemingway, grows up in Michigan. His situation is very different from that of Joe Butler, the young narrator of My Old Man. Joe's world is Europe, and more particularly the hard, tough, cynical world of the racetrack. With his father, Joe leads a rootless existence among people who don't speak his language. He doesn't go to school. In fact, he has no friends of his own age. Remember how the young girl at the cafe affects him. Once there was an American woman sitting with her kid daughter at the next table to us. I made up ways that I was going to speak to her. And I wondered if I got to know her, if her mother would let me take her out to a toy or trim blade. But I never saw either of them again. Anyway, I guess it wouldn't have been any good. In a way, Joe's father is his world. So long as his image of the old man remains untarnished, Joe feels safe. You know, Joe, during the war, we used to race down the south of France without any purses or betting, not even a crowd watching us, just to keep up the breed. Boy, we used to race hell out of those horses, just like there was big money in it. It's funny. But the way Joe sees his father, and the way a reader of the story sees him, are not quite the same. When I'd sit watching him working out, I sure felt fond of him. He sure was fun, and he'd done his work so hard. Joe sees his father wholly through the eyes of love. Come on, Dad! Everybody liked him. And whenever I'd come into the cafe, I'd find somebody drinking with him because my old man wasn't tight like most of the jockeys. Hi, kid. In a very real sense, Joe's vision of his father, coming as it does from the heart, is truer than any other possible view of the old man. But what Joe misses is the pathos of his father's situation. What's the matter, Dad? Oh, the heck with it. Butler is fighting his demons. Age, a tendency to overweight, a weakness for the bottle, and his reputation as a crooked jockey. And he's tired. But he's not beaten. He can still ride and his all-redeeming quality is his love for his son. Joe doesn't seem to see or won't acknowledge his old man's human failures. But it's natural to assume, and this is what Hemingway does assume, 
that when doubts about his father appear at the edges of the boy's mind, he will thrust them back. Remember the adjective he uses so often? Of course I knew it was funny all the time. It's funny sitting there. And that was funny thinking of George Gardner that way. Gee, I remember the funny people that used to go by. Anything Joe doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand is funny. There's a certain kind of reality which he keeps at a distance because it threatens his faith and his security. And doesn't his father know it? Doesn't he feel the gulf between his son's loving vision of him and the whole truth about himself? Wasn't it a swell race, Dad? George Gardner's a swell jockey, all right. Sure took a great jock to keep that czar us from winning. This is a plea for understanding, however indirect, but the boy turns it aside. Of course, I knew it was funny all the time, but my old man saying that right out like that sure took the kick all out of it for me. And I thought, I wish I were a jockey and could have rode him instead of that dirty cheat. It's much easier for Joe to blame George Gardner for throwing the race than to admit that his father is just another George Gardner or that he's involved in Sar's defeat. There's another aspect of Joe's self-protective attitude. His love for his father is almost matched by his love for horses. This Tsar is a great big horse that looks like just nothing but run. I never saw such a horse. I felt all hollow inside. He was so beautiful. The beauty of animals, this quality in the non-human world that moves Joe so deeply. Isn't it his refuge from whatever threatens him in the human world? It's the thing to which he clings, the pure thing, untouched by the world's meanness or greed. Never get another license to ride here, but uh, believe me, I can see to that. You'll be thrown, finished, understand? Listen to me, but uh, I want my money. And so Joe resists the knowledge that the horses are exploited and that they are somehow victims of adult motives he doesn't understand or want to. Want an ice cream, Joe? You son of a... You gotta take a lot of things in this world, Joe. Joe's dilemma is one that can be encountered at any age, under any circumstances. It's the conflict between our knowledge and our wishes, between the world of fact and the world of dreams. That was great writing. In the end, of course, Joe is betrayed by his father's world and left stranded on the threshold of maturity. The tragedy of his final situation is that at an age when he is beginning to feel deeply and to reach out for what life has to offer, he has one of those experiences that threaten to cut off feeling permanently at the root. What we finally got here is all right. Well, I don't give a darn if he did. He had it coming to him, the crooked deals he's pulled. Well, he won't throw any more races now. Yeah. After his father's death, when the world's judgment is pronounced clearly and brutally, Joe has to face another kind of truth about the old man. But that's just what he can't do. To face the truth would be to consign the memory of his father to the adult world that finds it so easy to judge, so difficult to love. I don't know. Seems like when they get started, they don't leave a guy nothing. <laughs>